It's the Positively Petland Show, 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, and we continue the conversation with Ron Solsrud, co-owner of Petland in Iowa City. Ron, the Lhasa, how did you say it? The Lhasa Opso. Do you have to say it like that? I think so. I, 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 you know what? We're Americans. We're probably butchering that name right now, and we think we're doing a pretty good job of it. I always think of Lhasa Apsos as a really high maintenance kind of prissy dog. Why do you say? Why do you think that? Just because they look like it. Okay. Wait till you hear the history of this one. This is an, it's fascinating. I love this one. It make here after reviewing it, I want to have a Lhasa Apso at home. It's that. It's a rugged little. You do? Yeah. They're really. How many dogs do you have at home? Two. I did not know. So you have the trouble child and then you have and a Lhasa Apso. No, I have a dachshund. Oh, I, I wish I had one. Oh, I thought you said you had one. That's no, why I got confused. I, want I was one. like, wait a second. I'm doing the math. So anyway, uh, we're going to be talking about dog food. Um, the myths of. The myths of. Because last week we talked about premium foods versus, you know, what you're getting at the grocery store or at the big Mart store. And uh, how those foods in the marts and the grocery stores are being sold based on price. So you're buying cheap food. It's just the fact. That's the way it works in the dog food industry. Now, when you go to a pet store, um, local pet store, you're going to get, you can get premium food. I'm sure there's stores out there that have the cheap stuff too. Um, and what we talked about was, is that they're really high in nutrients that actually double almost double the nutrients per, uh, compared to the grocery store. So a premium food is really good in that way. You're going to feed less. As a result, they're going to poop less. 60 seconds? 60 seconds? Well, six, poop? No. Oh, um, uh, uh, What's the timer? Uh, 97 seconds. Okay. And then, uh, so you'll they'll poop less. That's good for you. And then it has all the supplements, all the great ingredients that are, you know, we know that if we eat good ingredients, we are healthier as a result. So those are premium foods. Today, we're going to get into the myths around dog food. Um, like, hey, Jerry, a grain-free product is better for a dog, isn't it? Yes. Uh, or you're not supposed to feed pork to your dog. I don't know. Yeah, that one, I, I, I read it. It was the number one myth. And I was like, wow. I, I, are I, you supposed to? I don't know. You, you can. Okay. Oh, wait, we busted oh, a myth already. Sorry, sorry. And, this but is, well, we will talk about why, where did that come from. Uh, kind of so thing. let's talk about uh, the Lhasa Opso. You say it so much more brilliantly than the I do. Lhasa Opso. See, now you already gave it away. I know it's. I know where it's from. You're not going to stump me with the uh, with the, uh, you know. <laughs> there was a pause there. All right. The Lhasa Apsu is an ancient breed. We're going to read from the AKC book of breeds right now and uh, get into the history, the form and function, and hey, what's it like to live with one of these little guys? So, uh, wait, did we stump you yet? No, because I think... This you... one is, I'm not, oh, I, I don't even know if you can call that a country, but what area? Well, name a, a mountain range that they might be from. <laughs> a mountain range? Yeah. The Alps. Okay, let's see if he is right. Originating in the isolated valleys of the Himalayan okay. mountains, particularly near Lhasa, Tibet's capital city, the Lhasa Apsu is a true reflection of its ancient heritage. Okay, so does it really look like its ancient heritage? Those were some funky looking people back then, if that was the case. Anyways, uh, these sturdy little mountain dogs, I love that, mountain dogs, have been have remained relatively unchanged for centuries. And the reason that it's going to get into, called the, the breed, is called Apso Sing Ki in Tibet. Best translated as bearded lion dog. Okay, let's go back to it resembles those ancient people and it's it's named after the bearded lion dog. Those people back then just didn't look too good apparently. But anyways, we're having fun with that. That's very judgmental. I guess I am. I'm sorry. The Lhasa's primary function was that of a household sentinel guarding the homes of Tibetan nobility, and Buddhist monasteries. In their native land, these loyal companions were highly prized. Received one, uh, receiving one as a gift was a considerable 
honor. British colonists in India escaping the summer heat in the Himalayan foothills. That is quite a get away from it. Go from Britain to the Himalayan mountains to get away from the heat. Uh, so they were in the foothills. First saw examples of Lhasa Apsus in the late 19th century. So these guys, th this uh, book here does not go as far back as the Lhasas, but I believe they date these things, uh, to date this breed back to the 25, 2500 BC. So that's a long time ago. And we only started getting them in the 19th century, which wasn't that long ago. Many took Lhasas with them when they traveled to England, where the earliest standard for the breed was written. In the 1930s, American C. Saddam Cutting that's a really long name, traveled to Tibet and became intrigued by the breed. His correspondence with the 13th Dalai Lama led to the breed's arrival in the United States. So that's how they got here. So, so yeah, this is why I said it seems like a very complicated dog. That There's a lot going on with the history of this dog. I know, that's dog. what I love about this dog. It's very <laughs> cool. So, uh, and it is a, a little bit on the complicated, not like in a big way. The Lhasa structure reflects the breed's origin in Tibet's mountain terrain. Medium muzzle length. So this is not a pushed in nose dog. Uh, contributes to efficient respiration. The long rib cage allows for increased lung capacity, higher elevations and bigger lung capacity. In fact, these little ones, oh, they're sleeping, um, are, they, they, remind me of a little baby because their bellies are so big and round and long. So when you pick the little Lhasa puppy up, you're like, wow, there's a lot to this little thing. Are these Lhasa pu These are, yeah, here. No, Let's there's no, they're napping right now. Okay. Just, just finish right. with your, just finish with yours. All right. So then a heavy dense coat and heavily coated pads offer protection from extreme climate and rugged surfaces. Um, don't get the wrong idea. You like the coat here, if you can re remember a Shih Tzu, it's kind of in that realm maybe a little thicker you know and that's it keen hearing and suspicion of strangers are traits reflective of the breed's function as a sentinel the lhasa is intelligent often exhibiting a regal attitude which is then belied by a clownish sense of humor and his joy of life attitude that's what i love about the lhasa independent by nature lhasas are bright observant and keenly responsive to positive reinforcement training. Losses are slow to mature and age gracefully, keeping a youthful appearance and attitude well into their teens. Losses thrive on daily walks or frequent exercise in fenced areas, as would every dog. Uh, potential owners must be willing to go and provide activities to occupy the dog's intelligent mind as with every dog, uh, allotting time each day for positive interactive play as every dog, Lhasa enjoys making their owners laugh. So have a sense of humor is a plus. All right. As with every dog. As with every dog in person <laughs> on that one. So those those last final com uh, comments there I, I thought were funny. Um, it did uh, describe this dog as a, more of an independent dog. Um, yet they kept on saying it needs a lot of attention, which I thought was a little, isn't that one of those like oxymoron kind of things? Yeah. Um, if yeah. do you are you in a situation where hey i'm looking for a breed um something that's a little more independent but but i want the dog you know i want the happy-go-lucky i want the fun and all that kind of stuff that's where this breed comes into play uh it is a long hair non-shedding breed so if you are like hey that's a little high maintenance non-shedding is high maintenance if you have that situation then just cut the hair down have the groomer cut it down a little further so it's easy maintenance at that point that is the lhasa opsu and so you touched on a few things if you, it can be high maintenance if you want it to be right if you like that long hair i then guess as with every dog. As with every dog. <laughs> i know when we had our cocker spaniel mom would always like to get the full cocker cut um, with the full skirt and, you know, what I'm talking about on mm -hmm. the legs and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. And oh, then there was the burrs and everything. That but. was a lot of work to be able to keep her combed out. And she was such a great dog. But um, <clears throat> so now we turn our eyes towards premium pet food and dispelling some of the myths. And I know one of them that you mentioned last week was using, what is it called, chicken meal? Yes. And that's one of the, yeah, we'll get into that myth. And because it doesn't sound, you know, meal seems kind of 
I don't know, uh, meal. It just doesn't have that kind of or that that strong. Uh, right. Well, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't have a sexy name. Is what it ends up being. So, let me pull up my little notes here. So. Uh, the first myth that's out there, and I actually I'm borrowing this by chance from AKC as well t uh, this week. Um, the first myth that is out there is never feed dogs pork. Well, that would be incorrect. That is a myth. Uh, here, all of these, if your dog actually has an issue with them, just like us, like I can eat most everything out there. But if you have an allergy towards something, well, then you want to steer away from that. So just these out of are curiosity, what's the myth against pork? It's just, uh, I think it goes back to history where pork was not uh, a clean food. Okay. And so people went that way. Another thing that I think gets confused on here, um, and they didn't bring it up in here, is don't feed a large, uh, big chewer type dog a, a pork bone. Um, that would be inc a bad thing because those bones are softer than beef buffalo and venison so those you want to if you have a strong chewer small or big stay away from the pork bones stay away from the chicken bones those are even worse uh, so then get back into the other ones so they've translated that oh well then don't feed your dog pork either well that obviously doesn't translate uh, that there, there's no comparison there so pork is healthy for your dogs and jerry keep me on on pace here for our show please you are because i love to talk too much Lamb is hypoallergenic. So where this came from, if you are under that impression, is, is oh, about 10 years ago or more, 15 years ago-ish, they started coming out with uh, hypoallergenic foods. And what was happening is, is, again, science had nothing to do with this. They were, chicken was the most popular protein source in foods and it actually still is today uh, as a consumer you are more likely to go get a chicken based dog food than any other based dog food um, so uh, land oh but then allergies started and the uh, veterinarians started conjecturing of what the allergy might be at the beginning and i think this is also word of mouth uh, on the internet they started going and saying chicken was uh is a allergen and all that kind of stuff well that would that would be incorrect as well as well for most dogs well they went to lamb because they just found if they switched to lamb life was better well they switched from one dog food to another and a lot of things changed between those dog foods uh, not just the protein and those others were where the allergy was, but people made a generalization and said, oh, it must have been the chicken. So lamb became the hypoallergenic. It is just as allergic -y as all the other protein sources. And you, if you are, if you, there is an allergen towards a chicken, then lamb would be fine. But in general, dogs are fine and cats are fine with all sources of protein. It's usually not the protein source where the allergen is. Um, high protein diets cause kidney failure. Okay, so this one came from uh, really high quality foods went on a very high protein kick. So 28 to mid 30s is kind of where the general rule of thumb for protein sources are. And it then they started kicking it up higher and higher. In fact, cat uh, food is much higher in protein. Well, they started going in that direction and they got into the 40s and 50s uh, percent uh, protein in the bag. Uh, that they then, all of a sudden, this thing came out. Kidney failures were happening all over the place. Well, there was that's a myth. That did not occur. That was people just saying that. It caught wildfire kind of a thing and everybody started saying it. Um, but a high protein, that high of protein is probably not needed for your dog. If you have that dog that is, you know, the hunting dog, massive running dog, you have a hard time keeping weight on your dog, then go to those higher proteins and just slowly eke yourself up to them um, or just feed more kind of a thing. Um, those are good for those type of dogs. Small dogs, I stay in the 28 to 35 percent and you're going to be fine there. So high protein diets cause kidney failure. False. Moving on, meat is more nutritious than meat meal. So on the foods that we have uh, in our studio right here, you're going to feed, you're going to see, let's say it's a uh, chicken. Um, you're going to see the first ingredients as deboned or chicken or something like that. That means that's called wet weight. Uh, that is before cooking. They can put that ingredient on there. 
So it's what we look at and we go, well, that's what I want. I want the debone chicken. Um, the next thing usually is the same thing, chicken, duck, uh, whatever it is, meal, chicken meal. That's cooked weight. Both of those, chicken and chicken meal, are the muscle and skin uh, primarily of the, the chicken in this case. Um, meal just means that it was cooked. What does that mean to you? The higher up in the ingredients list that that meal is, a chicken meal, the better because if it's uh, cooked, that means it's 300% uh, concentrated in protein. Uh, so you're not paying for the, the water and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's higher in the ingredients list after it was cooked. Um, I use the analogy of when we go and eat a quarter pounder, it's a quarter pound before they cook it. It's not a quarter pound after they cook it. It is much less. So to have, you know, if, if it was a quarter pound after it was cooked, that would be a meaty burger. So, so the myth is, is, um, meal, meat meal, <coughs> chicken meal, duck meal, uh, uh, beef meal. That's a, that, that is good for them. It's, it's, uh, it's just a, a cooked portion of the meat grain. So the next myth grain, especially soy or corn is bad for dogs. Again, this would be an incorrect statement. Um, we eat corn. Uh, is it as nutritious as some other things? No, but it's still good for us. Um, where this came in is, okay, let's go back to those cheap foods that we find in the mart and in the uh, grocery stores and all that kind of stuff. They packed and still today pack those foods full of cheap ingredients. Hey, if I'm Mr. Corn Producer and I'm trying to get the good ingredients out of it so that I can feed that to people and I have this other stuff from the corn that what do I do with it? This is what usually in the past went into dog foods and still today into the cheaper dog foods. So the the uh, hull or the hull or the, what do you call it? The thing around the corn here. I mean, the, the husk. The, the, well, that's the husk. But what's the capsule around the corn? What do you call that? The, the capsule. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, we're in farm country, and I, I'm the, feeling the, very vulnerable. The kernel? Is that what you're talking the about? The kernel. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing. But it's the hard shell around the kernel I'm is what I'm talking sure about. I'm sure I know this. That has very little nutrition. Our bodies can't break it down. And so they, what do you, if you're trying to get the good ingredients out of the corn, which are that's what our uh, manufacturers do, um, they leave that out. They get that out and get it onto the side, and that's what goes into the dog food. You know another thing that I think this is a little gross – um, that has a lot of protein in it, but is not digestible at all, hair. And so if you take a cheap dog food, crack the kibble in half, and you will be amazed on you will see the hair because it also doesn't cook. And so that's a little gross. We'll move on. But just know that that's where they get protein sources. Hey, I can't digest it. Uh, so is it really a, a valid protein source? No, not for us, not for our dogs, or not for our cats. So grains are actually good for dogs. Dogs eat grains in the wild and, now, and also at home and provide critical nutrients. Omega-3s and fatty acids are in those grains as well, and, and so um, that's a good source. Uh, some other real quick ones. I don't know if you're feeding your dog raw eggs. You can stop. Um, there is no benefit, big benefit on on doing that. You can actually get this stuff from eggs, uh, from grains and stuff like that. And raw eggs, just like we're not supposed to eat them because they might have some little bugs in them and all that kind of stuff. Not a good idea. And then dogs don't like variety. If you're a dog, it's just like us. If we grew up eating hot dogs, that's all we eat are hot dogs. But if we uh, grew up and we had to try that beat for the 15th time, you know, kind of thing. Well, then we are going to have a wider palate. Same thing with your dogs. And I would do this as soon as possible is mix it up a little bit. If you're feeding origin out there, feed the different types of origin out there. You can stay within the same manufacturer and you'll have a very consistent food, but you're just changing up the protein source. So dogs do like variety. So those are the myths that are out there that we just demystified. And there it is, the Positive, Positively Petland Show, Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. What else is going on at Petland, Ron? 
oh, we've got the buy 10, get one free on all of our dog and cat food. Uh, and where are we are competitively priced our taste of the wild. I get a kick out of that. We get it in by the pallets. And right now we have a wall. Oh, taste of wild. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, I can't see the rest of my store. This needs to get, you know, and by the weekend it'll be bought down. So buy 10, get one free. We track it for you. It is that easy. Um, and then uh, we also have the $5 nail trim. You can't beat a $5 nail trim. Bring them in. Bring your vaccination schedule. We'll keep it on file for you. And then just come on in. No appointments necessary. We take care of you right there. Where are you located? We are located in the Marketplace Mall. That's over in Iowa City, uh, right across from Lucky's Market. Uh, and our hours of operation today are noon until 6. That's Sunday. Um, and then all other days are from 10 a.m. until uh uh, 9 p.m. But today, Sunday, noon until 6. It's the Positively Petland Show every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Thanks for stopping in, Ron. Thank you.